Hi, I'm Christian Sager from How Stuff Works, and we are here at DragonCon and lucky enough to get to speak with experts on all things about science and technology. Today, we're here with neuroscientist Jennifer Watson, who, <laughs> as I understand it, you just got your doctoral degree from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. Yep. Congratulations. Thank you. So, your specialty is in biomedical engineering and in neuroscience. We've all got brains. Everybody who's going to be watching this has a brain, I hope. Uh, <laughs> and they're all vulnerable to disease or damage in some kind of way. So from what I understand, uh, you primarily are looking at mutations in the brain that lead to neurological disease? Correct. And so um, I'm a forward geneticist. And so there's two different means that you can study genetics. So you can utilize reverse genetics. And so what that does is it takes a gene that you find interesting and then you manipulate it, you knock it out, you, you can conditionally knock it out, and then you see the effect of the phenotype on that mutation of that gene. Okay. However, we go about it a different pr approach. I'm technically a neurogeneticist and I do for genetics as, as my main experimental technique. And so what we do is we find a mouse that has an interesting phenotype. I picked a, a spontaneously occurring mouse mutation. It arose in a um, inbred strain in about the 1950s and the mouse is very ataxic and at three weeks of age the mouse is phenotypically normal and then undergoes this just incredibly fast neurological progression uh, disease that leads to his death in five weeks. So the animal dies incredibly quickly. Okay. And so he's ataxic, he's clumsy with his motion, he's paralyzed by the end of his life. And so we know that whatever this gene is, is important for the nerve, nerve, nervous system development. And so we can use positional cloning techniques. So you've got, you know, 10,000, 20,000 genes. And so we're able to use positional cloning to find which gene has a mutation that caused the phenotype that we saw. And so my, my entire project was cloning this mouse. And so I found, uh, actually it was a missense mutation on chromosome 11. And so chromosome 11 probably has 122 megabases, so 122 million base pairs. And so we found a single point mutation within 122 million base pairs. Wow, so that's like a uh, that's like needle in a haystack exactly. kind of research, right? Exactly. So the applications of this to human science and medication then are Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, Huntington disease, and so, uh, let me, I might be pronouncing this wrong. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis? Yep. So that's Lou Gehrig's disease. <laughs> oh. And so, okay. and so the ice bucket challenge has been based on that disease. And so that's an upper and a lower, lower motor neuron disease. And so my work specifically, so I work on the peripheral nervous system. So the ataxia and the paralysis is mostly, mostly based in the peripheral nervous system, but mm -hmm. could be based in the brain and the spinal cord. There's been this interesting finding that in a lot of neurological diseases like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's, that there's a hit to a certain biological pathway and it's called the endosomal sorting pathway. And it's important because you have all these plasma membrane proteins on the cell surface. And so the thing is, is neurons are huge compared to like your kidney cells, your liver cells. Okay. And for your peripheral nerves, for instance, your motor neuron resides in your spinal cord and innervates your foot. So this cell is a meter long. And so the regulation of these plasma membrane proteins is really important. And what we're finding is in Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease that this pathway specifically hit. And so what's interesting, I think, is that bit by bit as we identify the different genes that cause these diseases, we'll be able to put together a pathway and we'll be able to put together drugs that fix those pathways when they go wrong. So that leads me to ask you about what seems to be, no pun intended, ubiquitous to your work, which is <laughs> something called ubiquitin, mm -hmm. right? Can you explain what that is and yep. why it's important to this? So ubiquitin is a 76 kilodalton protein. And so this is a relatively small protein, but it's a post-translational modification. And so you have your genome, the, the RNA is the output to the genome, and then you have your protein that's the output from the RNA. And so proteins, once they're, they're made in the nucleus and they're transported to where they're supposed to be, they're regulated even more so than just where they end up going. Like for instance, the nervous system, like there's really good evidence showing that there's a neur neural growth factor called TREK A. Mm -hmm. In Alzheimer's disease, it's misregulated. And it, it's, mis it's a growth factor. So when it starts getting misregulated, the neurons start to die and it leads to the neuronal death that you see in Alzheimer's disease. And so um, ubiquitin essentially serves as a marker for proteins to tell them where they need to be in the cell. Like you need to be on the plasma membrane and you need to keep signaling with your growth factors or you need to be degraded. You need to go away because we need this to stop. Okay. And so it seems in Alzheimer's disease that there's to almost too much of this signaling pathway. And they see that in Alzheimer's disease you get, you get ubiquitin aggregates and it's these proteins that don't know where to go. And so no one really knows why Alzheimer's disease or why, these, why there's ubiquitin plaques, 
but there are. And so there's some misregulation in this pathway. So that's why it's critical to understand is because yeah. in almost every neurological disease, like in Lou Gehrig's disease, in, in Alzheimer's, in uh, Parkinson's, they all have ubiquitin aggregates. So there's something unique in the nervous system that ubiquitin regulates and it's important for the nervous system to function. Okay. So here at DragonCon this weekend in 2014, you were giving a panel, I believe it was last night, yep. right? You, you did a panel that was on the brain and its anatomy. Yep. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what, what that was like and you know, how you presented to uh, what was largely a group of you know, lay people, I would right. assume, right? Right, and so what I did with this talk, and I had a, honestly, I had a great crowd and it was a lot of fun. You know, I've talked a lot about cells at this point. Mm -hmm. We have a relatively good understanding of how cells work and how proteins are trafficked. But the problem is figuring out functionally, how does that lead to consciousness? How does that lead to these higher order functions that human beings have? And the thing is, is that's hard to study. You can't injure someone's brain and then see what happens. So the thing is, right. is we find this through injury. Uh -huh. And so there's patients that have these very unique case stories. For instance, patient HM is one of the most popular neuroscience patients that's known. And he was an epileptic and his hippocampus was what drove the seizures. Okay. In the 1950s, he was like, all right, we'll just take that out. We'll take that out and you'll stop having seizures. And he did, but he lost his memory. Okay. He no longer had long-term memory. And so, essentially what I did is told these stories that people that lose their hippocampus, that allowed us to figure out that the hippocampus is critical for long-term memory consolidation. And there's a bunch of different stories, like there's a lady called patient SM, who she had her amygdala retracted, okay. and she has no fear, oh, because the amygdala wow. regulates fear. And so there's all these hilarious case stories about like, essentially her physician's trying to scare her. Uh -huh. Like, they take her to haunted houses and they try to jump out and say, and she wouldn't because she didn't have the neurons to do it anymore. Wow, and so there's all kinds of these stories that yeah. I think you can relate to because you're a, you're, <laughs> you're a people and you understand how that works. So, okay, so this is making me think of two things. First of all, when I was a kid in high school, I remember learning about a patient and I can't remember what his name was, but the story went was that he was a railway worker and he had a rod from the rail go up through his head? Do you, do you yep, know this, this is Phineas Gage. Phineas Gage. And he's name. another one of those really popular, <clears throat> like honestly, HM and Phineas Gage are like the two, really what we've learned a lot functionally about what the brain does. Mm -hmm. And so Phineas Gage actually, they think he was turning his head, the tampering rod broke his molar and tore out his left prefrontal cortex. Okay. He, this story just always amazes me because the tampering rod went 20 yards away from him. It shot through his head. It threw him back. He kind of shuddered, never went unconscious, yeah. stood up, got into a cart, rode to town, went and saw a doctor, but like everything worked, right? He was yeah. able to walk. He was able to talk. He was able to do all these functions. But what they always say is that Gage was no longer Gage. Right. That it, he, if I remember correctly, it was almost like he was drunk all the time and that he had anger management issues yep. when he didn't have them before, right? Yep. So he was 25 years old and he ran, he was essentially, he coordinated the railroad construction project. Mm -hmm. And they said like he was dead on. He was always had like ironclad concentration and then he just didn't anymore. Like he would like he jump from task to task. He could never pay attention to anything for longer than a couple of seconds. Yeah. And that's actually interesting because people with ADHD and ADD, yeah. it's thought that there's alterations in prefrontal connections that keep them from having that attention as, as well as a normal person would have. And they also said he lost impulse control. Yeah. And the problem is is this was a long time ago. This was like 1869. Mm -hmm. So the stories like there are people that work on Phineas Gage, trying to figure out which stories are correct, what was real. But there's one story that he essentially just kind of toured the Northeast and he'd stop at colleges and be like, hey, I'll sell you my brain when I'm dead. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. Yep. And so that's that leads me to the second thing that I'm fascinated by with this angle of research is that by today's standards, if you're going to have an institutional re uh, board review your mm -hmm. work, they're not going to let you fire a, a rod through a guy's brain to find out what happens to him because exactly. of ethical reasons. Exactly. So this puts you in the quandary where you have to find accidental cases like this, right? right? How does that affect the research? It's hard. I mean, and that makes it really hard. For instance, I'm a mouse geneticist, mm -hmm. but at the end of the day, I can't ask that mouse if he's having an attention problem. Right. We can design tests and like, and honestly, we've done a very good job designing tests. Like we have very good memory tests. We have very good, like fear conditioning is a great assay. But at the end of the day, 
like testing consciousness, testing things like that, something we really can't do. So uh, most of the studies that we have that let us understand functionally what the brain is doing are there are lots of epilepsy cases. Okay. Because people have irretractable epilepsy and if you have 10 seizures a day, you're not functioning. Mm -hmm. And so people will take that chance. They'll be like, all right, well, I have this bit of my temporal lobe that's causing a seizure, take it out, we'll see what happens. And that's mostly what the case studies are that we know is just, these people signed a, signed a contract that said, you can do this because it's going to make my life better in the end. But the problem is you don't want to do an experiment that doesn't make someone's life better in the end. Right. So that's the problem. So one last thing then, mice. Why do we use mice to study the, the human brain? What about it, what about mice is like us? that right. makes it work so well? So, they, they, mice are very different from us. Like for instance, with H&M, we learned a lot about the hippocampus and what that does for humans. But the hippocampus in the mouse is almost entirely different. It's okay. huge compared to ours, you know? But why is a mouse's hippocampus is huge? Well, the hippocampus is important for spatial memory and spatial learning. Well, a mouse probably needs to know how to navigate the world around him more so mm. than we, I mean, we do too but more so than we do. We have higher cognitive functions that we can essentially use to overcome that. But I think that um, we know their genome wonderfully. Okay. Like the, the mouse genome has been mapped and the tools that we can utilize to manipulate the genome are very well characterized in mice. And so that's why we use mice. And like there's some, I think that there's, there's a couple of projects in primates that you can manipulate the genome, but that's, that's morally questionable too. These are smart creatures. They're, almost just as smart as us with different skill sets, you know? Okay, yeah. And so I think that it's us drawing a line at some point, saying right. that these mice have cognitive capacities, they have skills that we can study, they're not human, but it's a good enough model that when you, when you do this, it's not morally questionable. And in certain circumstances, you could say it is morally questionable, but I think at the end of the day, like my research, for instance, I identified an entirely new gene that can cause neurological disease, and I think, we can screen patients for that. We can screen patients for motor neurons. We can identify that these genes are important. Right. At the end of the day, I think that's worth it. Now, if you were to ask me if I needed to do that in a primate, I would have another answer. Yeah. I wouldn't be willing to do it in a primate. Okay. But I think that mice are lower cognitive creatures that I think it's moral to do. And as long as you do it in a moral way. And we have very specific rules we have to Strict follow and everyone does it, you know, yeah. because we know <laughs> the moral clauses of our job. And I think that that's impo important to know when you do it too, you that's, know. Oh, that's great to hear. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your of day course. to come and speak with us today, Jennifer. And if people want to learn more about your work and, and what you're studying, where can they find you at? So I uh, attend the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And so if you Google my name in UAB, I'll come up in the neuroscience program. Um, if you go to PubMed, which is an NIH run literature search, I have, I think, five publications now and you can look, look at them there. I was reading some of them in PubMed this morning. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, if you have any more interest in learning about the brain or other aspects of science, don't forget to subscribe to this channel, like this video, and hey, let us know what you think about brains, neurological diseases, and whatnot in the comments below, especially if you have any questions for Jennifer. Maybe we can pass them on to her and talk to you once again sometime. Maybe Sounds next great. year at DragonCon. Sounds Con. great. All right. Thank you very much. And don't forget to visit us at HowStuffWorks.com.